welcome again to the Caspian Policy Center. This is the second day of the Trans-Caspian Forum, the fifth Trans-Caspian Forum. Uh, I'm Afghan, the CEO of the Caspian Policy Center, and uh, we will continue our uh, forum with two more panels today, and I'm very excited to have our energy session uh, this morning. Uh, we have two more panels lined up for today with many highly esteemed speakers whom we are gracious for their participation in our forum. The Caspian countries are positioned to play a definitive role in global energy markets. In December 2020, the Caspian region celebrated its first delivery of gas to Italy through the newly completed Southern Gas Corridor. Projects like this advance the ability to extend the reach of Caspian energy exports to Southern Europe and other markets globally. It has also garnered the attention of major players involved in the global energy trade. In addition, the governments of the Caspian are eager to implement projects to harness the region's vast renewable energy resource reserves. Developing the re renewable energy sector to realize the region's wind, solar, and hydro energy potential will transform the energy markets of these countries. I'd like to now turn the floor to Ambassador Robert Sikuda, who is our member of our advisory board and also served the U.S. Ambassador to Azerbaijan and the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Bureau of Energy Resources at the U.S. Department of State before joining CPC. Bob, uh, the floor is yours. Let's start our panel. Thank you very much, Afghan, and I'm very pleased to be here, and we have a great panel today. I think, you know, in, in, as we kick off the discussion today, and I'm looking very much forward to uh, uh, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary Donnelly's remarks, one of the things that in the past we've often talked about the CAST as a supply center, as a role in energy security, but the whole question is of energy security are changing today. Um, we're looking a lot at the questions of the environment. We're looking at questions of, of internet connect, uh, the AI and the um, integrity of, of internet systems. Um, we're looking at changing dynamics in terms of suppliers, the geopolitics of energy itself are changing. And so I think this is a really interesting time to be talking about these issues. I'm very much looking forward to our comments and, and the exchange with the great experts we've got on the panel today. Right now, please let me introduce um, Acting Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary um, of State, <coughs> excuse me, of State for Energy Resource Matters, um, Kurt Donnelly. Kurt, the floor is yours. Thank you. I look forward to your remarks. Thanks, Bob, and, and thanks for the introduction. Um, was having a little bit of technical difficulties here. So I'm on a less uh, less reliable line here. So I hope that everyone can hear me and, and I, that I don't get uh, dropped from the call from time to time. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here today to participate in this exchange at the Caspian Policy Center. These are important topics we're addressing and uh, it's, a, it's a privilege for me to take part in this discussion. Um, as uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Bureau of Energy Resources in the Department of State, one of the jobs I have is to strengthen our U.S. energy ties with countries in the Caspian region in Central Asia. Um, before, many years before coming to this job, I worked on Central Asia in the Obama White House for a couple of years, and so um, have watched the region uh, diversify and develop and see that political development uh, going forward. So I have a, a long and abiding interest in the success of the Caspian Central Asia region. So it, it's a double pleasure for me to join today. Um, one of our priorities is improving the region's interconnectedness with the global economy to avoid isolation that consolidates dependence on a single country for trade development and other things. We recognize that like rest of the world, internal and external factors are placing new demands on energy priorities in the Caspian region. New geopolitical realities, including the global pandemic and climate change are challenging us to reevaluate where we get our energy from and opening our eyes to new opportunities. Um, one of the biggest changes for us in our government and I think uh, around the world is the change in US administration and the emphasis that President Biden has placed on climate strategy. He has made climate strategy a central focus of US national security policy. And so we all have our marching orders that there has been an important change in our policy here in the United States. It is uh, with great ambition 
that we're, we're pursuing this policy. Um, we have some catching up to do because we, uh, for several years, we're not pursuing uh, ambitious policies uh, on global climate change. And so that means that what we're trying to do first starts at home. Um, we have a lot of changes to our own economy, to our own energy systems to, to put us on the pace to meet our uh, shared global targets of keeping the energy rise below 1.5 degrees centigrade by 2050. That requires essentially decarbonizing our economies, an enormous, enormous effort. <clears throat> the other ambition of the, of the US government in this light is to be a leader for the global ambitions of meeting our climate change targets. No one country is going to solve this problem for us. No one country is responsible for these problems. We all have to pull together. We all have to agree on our goals. We all have to find a way of implementing those. And the US wants to be a leader in that, not just a leader by example, a leader by rhetoric, but a leader by helping countries uh, find the best path for them to accomplish their climate change goals. And in that, of course, energy is job number one. Most of the greenhouse gas emissions come from the way we use energy. And so the way we use energy needs to fundamentally change. Um, in this new climate um, priority of the Biden administration, US energy policy focuses on three areas. These are three priorities that coexist. Sometimes they're very complementary. Sometimes they appear to be in conflict. They are decarbonization. I just talked about that. Secondly is energy access. If we have clean energy, but we have hundreds of millions of people around the globe who don't have access to reliable, affordable energy, then we failed in our task. And finally, energy security. This is a, a continuous problem that uh, we want to make sure that countries have reliable energy so that they can maintain Maintain energy services to their people and that they aren't subject to coercion and political pressure by malign actors. We, we especially see this happening with uh, Russia and it's near abroad, especially in Europe. And it's something that continues to be a very high priority for the Biden administration. Um, diversifying our energy resources and deploying clean energy and promoting innovation will be pivotal to achieving, achieving decarbonization, energy access, and energy security. This means a fundamental shift away from hydrocarbons to electricity, which will be provided primarily from renewable energy sources. And the US wants to lead in that. We, we are a leader in a number of these important technologies. We wanna share that uh, with our partners around the world so that we jointly achieve our goals. Um, and that, that actually means that uh, we're also undergoing an enormous change in how we conduct our foreign policy. Um, we're engaging with our friends and allies in cooperative process to achieve these goals. We also have tough talks with countries that don't see things exactly the way we do. And that's a challenge to our foreign policy, but one we're, we're um, very excited to take on. Uh, the private sector is also responding to the urgency and economic opportunities presented by climate change. Uh, Chevron's uh, shareholders voted to impose steeper emission cuts and ExxonMobil's board now includes three new climate focused members. These are sea changes in uh, our corporations and um, I think we're going to see more of this and it's gonna have an impact. But the bottom line is uh, we're not gonna meet our goals without the private sector, without the private sector's expertise, without their diversity of solutions and most importantly, without their investment. Governments are not going to be able to meet the investment needs for this huge transition. Um, we see the greater Caspian region as well positioned to meet these challenges ahead. <clears throat> there are both short-term and long-term opportunities for the United States and Caspian countries to explore. <clears throat> so um, the IEA says that achieving our 2050 goals will mean essentially no new investment in oil and gas starting now. So no, no new exploration, <clears throat> no new production coming online in the, the coming decade. Um, that's a dramatic uh, point that they're making. Is that, uh, is that completely binding? Is that the only way? I'm not sure, but the IEA is a very credible uh, and reliable international organization. They've studied this issue. And that's how they see 
um, how we're going to get to our 2050 goals. That's very dramatic and a challenge to all of us. So let's talk about natural gas and its role in the transition. Um, this dramatic transition in how we're using hydrocarbons globally doesn't mean that natural gas demand is gonna stop suddenly, far from it. Imports of natural gas may in fact find bigger markets as transition companies um, focus first on transitioning, especially dirty fuels like coal and replacing them with natural gas. So uh, it's not clear how this transition is gonna play out but um, it may be that natural gas continues to have a primary role, at least in the early uh, portion of this transition. So what that means is countries who have uh, already taken advantage of their resources, say in natural gas, are, are in a uh, very good position. And so I would say, for example, Azerbaijan has placed itself very well. Um, the, uh, the completion of the Southern Gas Corridor has ensured uh, long-term demand for Azerbaijan's natural gas resources in a very reliable market in the European Union. We've long supported the Southern Gas Corridor. We've applauded its successful completion. Um, we are uh, very excited about the operation of the Southern Gas Corridor and also looking to that infrastructure to solve some other uh, energy related problems in the region, such as uh, diversifying uh, natural gas supplies to the Balkans region. Um, but there are other ways that the Southern Gas Corridor can be helpful in solving our regional and global energy challenges coming up. Um, but on the downside, it means that countries that have um, natural gas resources but haven't already. Uh, aren't already producing them, aren't already um, solidifying their uh, markets for their natural gas resources are, are facing some very serious challenges. And I, and I think of Turkmenistan in this regard. Um, for decades now, um, there have been repeated uh, efforts to find a way to include Turkmenistan gas into the Southern Gas Corridor or in other ways to be exported to markets in Europe. Um, that opportunity may not be there for much longer. Um, Europe is undergoing a very fundamental change in its energy systems. They're doing it very rapidly. And uh, the outlook for natural gas demand is uh, uncertain right now. And it raises a question, uh, a very important question, which is, does Europe need new sources of natural gas. Um, for a long time, Turkmenistan seemed to be the answer for Europe when natural gas was, demand was growing dramatically. Um, right now, there's a risk that uh, Turkmenistan may miss this opportunity and uh, in, in a decade or two may find that there aren't markets for its gas the way that uh, had been anticipated. So I think there's a, there's a, a warning there that um, the world is changing and something that was a valuable resource 20 years ago and everybody wanted to buy it, um, that may not be the case in another decade with the dramatic change that we're, we're seeing. Um, let me just turn to, to renewable energy. We really encourage the region to embrace the economic opportunities in renewable energy. In, in addition to other clean energy op options such as carbon capture and hydrogen and a whole host of other uh, technologies. Clean energy initiatives mean boosting innovation, uh, boosting investment and, and new jobs for our people. The United States is interested in exploring how we can work together through technical exchanges and importantly, public-private partnerships with Caspian countries to further develop renewables as part of your um, climate solution. The Caspian has enormous potential for developing alternatives to oil and gas. As we know, hydropower and wind are particularly good options in several countries in the Caspian and Central Asia region. Geothermal is also another uh, option that I think needs to be explored more. Um, but then we turn to, to other technologies like advanced nuclear energy technologies offer some really promising opportunities.
opportunities to address our need for clean energy. Um, clean hydrogen, carbon capture, biomass, our, our options for replacing uh, especially dirty um, power production from coal generation, which we view as a, as a first priority for addressing climate change. Um, all of those technologies are being worked. Many of them are out there. They're ready to be deployed. Some we're waiting for new technological advances. Prices for these technologies have dropped dramatically. So they make a lot of sense to, um, to implement, uh, to deploy these technologies in energy mixes in the Caspian and Central Asia. Um, one very important aspect of this is there isn't enough public sector money to accomplish all of our goals. Much of this is gonna to have to be done by the private sector, not just companies coming in with technologies and the ability to deploy these technologies, but also investment. So the generation of capital to pay for these new technologies, deploying these new technologies is gonna require uh, huge amounts of money from our private sector. And this is an important component of this that we have to, we have to take into account. Um, so let me just close, I've spoken for a long time. Uh, working together, we can build a reliable supply chains that offer Caspian countries alternatives to those of being dependent on one country. Renewable energy can meet domestic demand and strengthen regional connectivity and increase the resilience of our energy sectors. By diversifying energy resources, the Caspian region can position itself as an example of how countries can meet current energy challenges by contributing to our common interests in building partnerships focused on growth and innovation and our clean climate goals. I will close by saying that the United States takes its relationship with the greater Caspian region seriously. We want to work together with you to meet our regional and global energy and climate goals. Thank you very much. Looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Kurt. Those were great remarks. We really appreciate it and sort of setting out um, U.S. position, particularly you know, given the fact this is a new administration, is following a number of new roads and it's facing a number of new challenges. So with that, I'd like to move now to our panelists. Um, just in terms of logistics here, we will, I will introduce each of the panelists very briefly. Um, their bios are available to all of you to, to, you know, to, to track down and sort of to, to find out more about them. They're really distinguished and great group. Um, Q and A, um, Q and A's. Please put those in the Q and A function, um, and we'll be pulling those together for when we're done with each of the panelists making their opening remarks. So, with that, I would like to turn the floor over now to another of my old friends, uh, Deputy Minister of Energy of Azerbaijan, uh, Mr. Elnur Sultanov. Deputy Minister. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, dear participants, ladies and gentlemen, I will be mainly uh, focusing on power and renewable energy, given that SOCAR representative is here, some kind of division of labor wise and to save time. But if there are questions, of course, I would like to, I would be happy to answer those questions as well. Uh, liberation of Azerbaijan lands uh, from under Armenian occupation has created ample opportunities for cooperation in the region, uh, in the energy field as well. Uh, by, the, by the plan of the president of Azerbaijan, uh, Mr. Ilham Aliyev, uh, we are looking forward to turn Karabakh to green energy zone. Uh, this basically means reliance on renewable energy and efficient technologies. And in this context, I'm glad uh, to mention that we signed an implementation agreement with BP at the beginning of this month uh, for the development of industrial scale uh, power plant, uh, solar power plant in the southern part of Karabakh. And this is a statement to the world community that the peace there is sustainable and that the area is uh, safe for international private investment. And also, I cannot help but think about how BP what was with Azerbaijan, with other consortium members at the start of 1990s when we declared our uh, de jure independence and sovereignty and we developed our hydrocarbon energy resources. And now, after Azerbaijan, in a sense, restored its de facto sovereignty, um, BP is still with us. And this time, it's developing uh, the energy of 21st century, renewable energy. Uh, 
And I'm sure that we are going to be successful this time as well. Uh, also, uh, we are, Karabakh has huge potential in terms of uh, wind energy and hydro energy. And as, as Mr. Uh, Donnelly indicated, we are looking forward for investors. We are looking forward for private investors. As the Bajani government, budget money will be used minimally and we are creating all the conditions available for private investors and public-private partnership. This is the way to go. And this is the way to go in the world and in Karabakh, in other parts of Azerbaijan as well. Uh, I should, so you are going to be an investors and technology providers and know-how providers. They will keep hearing from us regarding terms and conditions of their involvement in Karabakh and other parts of Azerbaijan in coming days, continuously. I should also note that there are certain things that were unthinkable uh, before and that are happening that are giving us a lot of hope about the future of our region. For instance, in March this year, when Armenia was unable to get gas through Georgia because of some repair issues uh, of the pipeline system in the country, Azerbaijan made available its pipeline system. And for a couple of weeks, Armenia received its gas from Russia to Azerbaijan and then Georgia. Uh, to Armenia. And this is also an indication that we are really seeing uh, the start of sustainable peace in the region. Uh, in Azerbaijan as a whole, there's a presidential decree which targets Azerbaijan as a green energy space uh, till 2030. And we are very, working very hard in this context. Uh, the passage of renewable energy law on 31st of May is a great event. And among many other things, it's, it's going to pave the way for the holding of uh, auctions. Um, and we are working with EBRD on preparing the rules of these auctions. And again, you are going to be uh, hearing from us very soon, especially uh, international investor community will be hearing from us very soon in this regard as well. Uh, also, I would like to emphasize that we are rediscovering Caspian as a source of renewable energy. Uh, we are working with International Finance Corporation and BP, and our initial calculations show that uh, Caspian holds huge potential in terms of offshore wind energy. And right now in the Azerbaijani sector alone, we calculate to have 157,000 megawatts of energy. This is more than 20 times more than the installed capacity, current total installed capacity in Azerbaijan. Basically, in offshore wind in Caspian, we have more energy than we are going to be ever using in this country, which means that we have plenty of opportunity to export that energy uh, either as electricity or as green hydrogen. And currently there are some work that is being done to see whether Southern gas corridor pipelines are capable of transporting hydrogen mole molecules um, uh, forward to the region and beyond the region. So uh, I'm glad to tell you that we are rediscovering the Caspian and we are extending apparently the lifespan of the Caspian as one of the most important centers of energy in the world. And we already have this time a track record uh, of cooperation, regional and global cooperation starting from 1990s that we hope and we believe we are going to put into use and as I said, this time, we will be successful as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Minister. It was very helpful and a good bridge uh, from the previous remarks. Um, I'd like to, to uh, play now um, Deputy, uh, Deputy Minister of Ecology, Geology, and Natural Resources of Kazakhstan, uh, Madam Alia Shalabakov. Um, has, uh, was going to be with us, but she has not been able to do the travel, but is going to, we are going to uh, run a, a presentation she has prepared for us. So let me turn the floor back over to the chairs. Dear Chairperson, dear ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to thank you for organizing this fifth annual Trans-Caspian Forum. This conference gives us the opportunity to discuss main issues of the Trans-Caspian Corridor countries' development in the context of the current trends and mainstreams. Take into account that this forum is, the, is to embrace many different topics for discussion between policy and business leaders from the United States and the region. The issues of environmental and energy security are on the agenda of each country. One, one of them are achieving carbon neutrality and avoiding the use of traditional 
energy sources. The European Union plans to implement carbon tax on imports from 2023. We in Kazakhstan have conducted a preliminary analysis of the impact of the EU carbon tax on export earnings. By 2035, our economy may lose up to 8.4% of revenue per unit of products exported to the EU. These challenges require a review of current policies to achieve environmental and energy security, which are the basis for region's sustainable development and economic prosperity. Thus, despite the abundance of traditional energy resources, coal, natural gas, oil, during the summit of climate ambitious, President Akaev announced intention to achieve carbon neutrality by 2060. This is a determined perspective for our country. Given that Kazakhstan's economy is energy intensive, achieving the goal of, of the carbon neutrality requires the transformation of the energy industry and increasing the share of renewable energy sources in the energy generation. Kazakhstan has created the necessary regulatory framework for the development of renewable energy sources. As a part of the concept for the transition to a green economy, it is planned to achieve the share of renewable energy by 10% by 2030 and 50% by 2050. According to the experts' estimates, the potential of renewable energy in Kazakhstan is significant. Uh, for example, uh, the potential of, of wind energy is about 920 billion kilowatt per hour per year. The technical, uh, technically feasible hydraulic, hydraulic potential is estimate, estimated at 62 billion uh, kilo, kilowatt per hour per year. And the potential of solar energy in the southern regions of country may reach 2,500, 100, 300 solar hours per year. At the same time, the concept of low carbon development until 2000 is under development. The concept represents a long-term vision for development of the transition to a low greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the uh, amount of investment, investments uh, required in all sectors of economy and other important areas of transformation to ensure a fair transition and contribute to the achievement of, uh, of the Paris Agreement goals. In a Conclusion, yet. in addition, Kazakhstan has completed the work on updating the nationally determined uh, contributions, uh, which showed that the share of renewable energy use should be increased by 24% by 2030. The share of natural gas use should be 25% instead of planned 20. Uh, this both a challenge and opportunity. In conclusion, I would like to highlight that we open for cooperation in achieving the Paris Agreement goals while taking into account the energy and environmental security in the region. I thank you for your attention. Very much appreciate um, Deputy Minister Shalabayeva's remarks. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to turn now to uh, Dr. Isturk Savitov. I'm sorry. <clears throat> fighting allergies up here in Maine. Uh, Dr. Öztürk Savitop of the uh, Turkish Ministry of Energy and Minerals. Uh, Mr. Savitop. Well, um, thank you, Mr. Ambassador, distinguished participants and representatives. First of all, I'd like to thank the Caspian Policy Center for the organization of this forum and gathering us together through with a conference and Hopefully we are at the end of a difficult period and hope that next year we will have a face-to-face -face conference. Um, despite the global economic contraction and disruptions in the supply chain, the Caspian region continued to be a safe route for connection between Asia and Europe. However, low prices due to chains in oil and gas supply and demand created problems for some of the producing countries. And additionally, the pandemic marked the beginning of a period in which energy trade and investments change rapidly. Together with the new vision we will create for our region, the global recovery may be a unique opportunity for our region. The coronavirus pandemic has done unprecedented damage to the energy sector and economies. The world's biggest economies have been impacted by COVID to different degrees. After a 4% drop in global energy demand in 2020, 
considering the latest data on energy demand in the first quarter of 2021, we see that the effects of the pandemic on global energy use continue. Projections for 2021 indicate that as COVID restrictions are lifted and economies recover, energy demand is set to increase by around 5%. And almost 70% of the projected increase in global energy demand is in emerging markets and developing economies. As the world enters the second year of the pandemic and following the contraction in energy demand last year, economic activity and energy use appear to be in a rapid recovery phase. Um, distinguished participants, in that context, thanks to successful policies implemented, Turkey has been one of the rare countries that closed the year 2020 with growth. The Turkish economy grew by 1.8% in 2020 and by 7% in the first quarter of this year. Thus, Turkey became the fastest growing economy in Europe and the second fastest growing economy in OECD and G20 after China in the first quarter of this year. In line with our national energy and mining policy, which was adopted in 2017, we aim to enhance Turkey's energy perspective by improving energy supply security, increasing the use of domestic energy resources, localization, and increasing the predictability in the market. As we all know, energy supply security requires balanced, long-term and rational planning. In this context, as Turkey, we increase diversification with renewables, natural gas, and in somehow in domestic coal. An important addition to this diversification will be nuclear energy, as Mr. Court Donnelly also mentioned. As we believe that the renewables are one of the most important components of energy transition process, even during pandemic conditions, we attach importance to maintain existing renewable projects and to launch new ones that will contribute to boost economy and to increase employment. By implementing different support models, share of renewable energy sources in our total installed capacity has reached 52%. And with this rate, Turkey ranks fifth in Europe and 12th in the world. In the last 15 years, more than 60 billion US dollars of investment were realized by private sector in the energy sector of Turkey. And this shows the confidence of private sector to our market. Moreover, as we all know, energy efficiency is one of the areas that should be handled sensitively due to the key role it plays in the sustainability of economic growth and social development goals and in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. With our National Energy Efficiency Action Plan, which entered into force in 2018, it's aimed to reduce the primary energy consumption of Turkey by 14% in 2023 through 55 actions. Distinguished participants, undoubtedly, the last two years have been a milestone for natural gas sector in Turkey. Firstly, the discovery of around 400 BCM of natural gas last year in the Black Sea has been the biggest offshore discovery in the world. Furthermore, with the announcement of new discovery in the same fields, the total gas discovery reached around 540 BCM. And we hope with the ongoing exploration studies, we will discover more gas in this field and it will be a game changer for Turkey and the region. And we'll be one more, one more step closer to our being a regional trade center target in our region. And we are expecting to provide the first gas flow to our network by 2023. During this period, in order to reinforce our gas infrastructure, Turkey commissioned two FSRV terminals and increased the capacities of current LNG terminals. Moreover, investments have been ongoing in order to increase the underground gas storage capacity from 4.5 BCM to 11 BCM. And needless to say, we cannot forget the successful completion of TANAP ahead of the schedule, which is the backbone of the Southern Gas Corridor. Esteemed colleagues, you may have gas reserves, you may have strong gas infrastructure, but if you don't have a well-functioning, transparent and competitive market, you cannot sustain your system for a long period. You have to adapt your market according to the needs of this dynamic energy sector. A foreign investor wants to invest to a transparent and predictable market, having minimum regulatory risk, almost zero regulatory risk. In that regard, 
we have been introducing new instruments to our energy market by Istanbul Energy Exchange. For example, last week, electricity futures market started operation and in this year in October, natural gas futures market will be operational. To sum up, I can say that we learned much from this COVID pandemic with this crisis. We have seen how vulnerable or unprepared the global economy has been for such cases. And economic recovery, of course, is the priority of our countries. Within this framework, we believe international finance institutions can also play a vital role in supporting market players by variable methodologies such as refinancing or establishing new finance models in order to provide the continuation of the investments in the energy sector. Moreover, collaboration among countries will also help us to benefit from each other's experiences. In that regard, collaboration, which was shown during the Southern Gas Corridor process, would be a good example for a new partnership. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for this good building again on the point of the need for the private sector and the financing aspects of this, which are going to be crucial. And also mentioning an energy source which frequently gets forgotten, which is energy efficiency and what can be done on that front. Um, thank you very much for your remarks. Um, if I can turn now to Vitaly Balabayov, who is the Deputy uh, Vice President at SOCAR. Vitaly. Uh, thank you very much, dear Ambassador. Thank you very much uh, all for uh, inviting and having me here on this very interesting panel. I am replacing here Rashad Nasirov, who was announced and unfortunately couldn't participate due to the last minute circumstances. Uh, and uh, from my end, I would like to echo uh, Deputy Minister Sultanov uh, by saying that we in Azerbaijan and we are in Sokar. Uh, are pretty happy to make our small, maybe, but still uh, for us very significant input to the improvement of the energy security and supply diversification of the energy markets uh, in our region primarily and also in Europe. Uh, we have a number of significant developments since we last met here uh, at the similar panel back in June of 2020. Uh, I would like first to mention what has been mentioned already is that the Southern Gas Corridor is now fully operational system. Yes, we consider this as the first phase of the Southern Gas Corridor because we are telling to the world a number of times and we're repeating this now that we intend to expand the corridor and we expand to go further to the different markets. And we're considering different options for that. And the most obvious is obviously to expand to the Balkans, the region which primarily in many, many uh, countries does not have uh, developed gas distribution systems or does not have gas market at all. And if they do not have a market for gas, then what they're doing, they're burning coal. And even more than that, they're burning not only coal, but they're calling, uh, burning wood. Uh, so this is a region which consumes uh, and produces, uh, which produces a lot of carbon emissions, which produces a lot of CO2. And if supplied with the gas, and we estimate the need of the region uh, in the additional new gas supplies as 5 billion cubic meters of gas, definitely could provide very significant uh, input into the improvement of the overall environment uh, and, and change a lot in the world scale, not only in the European scale, not only in the Balkan scale. We in Azerbaijan are fully prepared to cooperate and work for that. And this is thanks to the fact that we now have Southern Gas Corridor huge project, biggest in Azerbaijan, biggest for Azerbaijan, biggest for SOFA, which we were planning to, uh, to build at $45 billion, but managed to at $33 billion, but also huge investment. Investments which was done, uh, conducted by us, our partners, and in cooperation with the international financial institution. They were multiple, from all around the world, European, uh, international, IFC, World Bank, EBRD, Islamic Bank for the Economic Development. So we work with all of them. We're very happy uh, to continue working with all of them. We, in this regard, very interested in uh, the scenario uh, of the International uh, Energy Agency uh, about the need to uh, make, to nullify the investments into the oil and gas sector. And we just uh, asking ourselves, Will, uh, who will benefit from that and how, uh, how will 
uh, we will be benefiting from that. Uh, what is of the concern for many, and I believe it should be for the, of the concern for the continuity of that, that it's such, an, and it has been repeated a number of times in the different gatherings, that if there is no investment, then at least in, within the transition period, uh, the cost uh, of uh, producing the oil and cost of producing the gas, and accordingly, the prices for these resources in the markets will grow enormously. Will grow enormously to the extent which will make the same transition mentioned transition very difficult. Uh, so that's the consideration number one. Consideration number two: what was uh, what was also uh, important for us, the most important achievements since June 2020, is obviously uh, success of Azerbaijan in liberation of its territories, which were under the uh, Armenian aggression. Uh, and occupation for more than 30 years now. Uh, so uh, not only this contributed obviously to the fact that now refugees can return to their homes and we have liberated territories which we uh, plan to develop in a very special, very green manner, if I may say that. But also this is important from the energy aspect because everything, the war itself started from the attempt uh, to take over the hills where we were presiding over the Southern Gas Corridor and for an energy corridor uh, where Bakut Belisi Jehan pipeline has been also played. So not only we returned our occupied territories, but we now improved the security uh, of the transit corridor of our energy resources, both crude oil and gas, to Europe. That's another significant achievement which happened during this period of time. Another one goes to the fact that there is a substantial breakthrough. Uh, in the regional cooperation. And we definitely consider this as a very important step. What have, I have in mind is the execution of the memorandum of understanding between Azerbaijan and Turkmenistan with regard to the development of the Dostum friendship uh, field uh, in the Caspian Sea. Uh, this is the great achievement, achievement which we now uh, we're trying to implement into the real agreement, real cooperation, planning, planning to start work. I'm proud that I'm part of that effort and I'm happy to report that both sides, the Turkmenistani side and the Azerbaijani side are working closely uh, on the commercial, on technical and different other aspects of the deal, which we uh, expect uh, to conclude in the course of 2021, which is kind of a record by all standards, because we started this really, really recently, uh, only in January of 2021. So in response to uh, remarks from Mr. Uh, Donnelly, I would like to again to say that we in Azerbaijan believe into the necessity of the regional cooperation between all involved countries. And the fact which was mentioned by Deputy Minister Sultanov about the cooperation between Russia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia in supplying Armenia with so much needed gas uh, at the period of time when it was also needed most is another evidence of the fact that we all can work together, work successfully together in solving our regional and beyond the regional uh, problems uh, if we really want to do that, if we have this intention, which we in so far definitely do. Another achievement, that's achievement out of so far, but I uh, cannot avoid uh, reporting this, is that uh, we are quite successful in Azerbaijan in our struggle, fingers crossed, of course, in our struggle with uh, COVID pandemic. Uh, from today in Azerbaijan, practically everything is open, is open for public. We opened malls, we opened restaurants, uh, we opened sport events. Uh, having uh, said about sport events, uh, the European Soccer Championship starts tomorrow and starts also in Baku making us closer to Europe in this regard, because we have already crowds uh, of the football fans from Switzerland, uh, from Great Britain, uh, from Turkey, of course, uh, coming to Baku, and we wish success to all of the players in the uh, football tournament. But of course, we wish the most of the success to our Turkish brothers, who will be also playing in Baku, and I'm sure the crowds will support them there. Uh, Yes, uh, these are the things which come immediately into mind. But also, I cannot avoid saying that we, together with you, uh, we're living in a very interesting period. We're living, we're living definitely in the time of the changes. Um, 
And these are important changes. Some people call it a revolution. Some people call it great revolution. I can tell you that I hate revolution. What I prefer to see actually is not green revolution, but I prefer to see green evolution. And Sokar uh, is definitely supporting the way to the greener economy. And we will be making, we did already actually, we uh, will be making our way into that greener economy by all means we can. Since 2019, we are uh, the, uh, we are members of the so-called uh, meta guiding principles, illustrating our commitment and other national and international oil companies' commitment to prevent prevent the leakage of the methane to the to the atmosphere. We also were the first uh, company in the Caspian region to end gas flaring in our gas fields. We will completely uh, nullify uh, the leakages of methane uh, into the atmosphere by 2022. We also, long time ago, introduced zero discharge policy for the offshore developments of solar and solar partners also. So all of this is clearly uh, indicates that we did something, to, but we can do more. And we definitely would like to do more and doing more. So what we would like to continue doing is to reduce uh, the climate impact of our oil and gas developments uh, where we where we conduct them, whether onshore or offshore. We also, uh, already mentioned here, opportunity of uh, us to develop the green hydrogen in Azerbaijan using the uh, electricity produced from solar and wind, the project which are successful on the way in Azerbaijan already, and uh, to uh, transport the produced green hydrogen through the thousand gas corridor system to the interest of customers. Uh, but primarily, of course, to use it in Azerbaijan as well. And that is very important that we would like to change the car fleet. We would like to establish new targets uh, for soccer. Net zero by 2050 is also a target which so far is actively developing at the moment. And we will continue doing that together with our foreign partners working with us on the different projects in Azerbaijan. But at the same time, we strongly believe into the need, for example, of the uh, nature of gas to fill into the gap which will exist in our belief for a long time uh, while we will be transiting to the greener economy. And with this regard, we welcome efforts of uh, our partners working together with us in Azerbaijan on the different projects. Being, uh, for example, project, and I'm sure that our colleague Favad will talk about that, Karabakh offshore field in Azerbaijan. With Total, we are developing Tapshon uh, gas field in Azerbaijan. Uh, with BP, we are developing Shafaga, Siman, Slava, and other uh, prospects, not even talking about next stages of the development of Shashar in this field. So CAR itself is developing Kumid and Babet, huge fields discovered by us in the Caspian. All of those will be sourced for the further development and expansion of the South Gas Corridor, which can still transport not only our resources, but the resources of the other Central Asian states or other states which will be interested in transporting its resources through the South Gas Corridor. Uh, Vitaly, I'm going to have to just wind up a little bit now. Thanks. Sorry. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Uh, so again, uh, interconnectivity, regional cooperation are the drivers which we would like to see developing in the not only uh, in the Caspian but also in our today's conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I turn the floor over now to Mr. Giorgi Chikovani, the CEO of the Georgian Development Fund. Mr. Chikovani. Is Mr. Hello. There. Yes, yes. Can you can you hear me? Perfect. Great. Go. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning. Uh, it's nice to see you. And thank you for the organizers, uh, and ambassadors, your excellencies. Hopefully, we will have a chance to meet in uh, live after such a long time of online conferences. And uh, looking forward to that event. I'll be very briefly discuss the uh, situation in Georgia, what's happened during COVID and uh, what's, what was, what's our plans in the energy sector. Uh, uh, in uh, last year, as uh, the whole world, we had downward shift in our economy. Uh, our energy demand uh, uh, shrinks by 5%, but uh, in the 
second quarter of 2021, we see strong growth in economy uh, compared to year 2019. Our economy has grown by 20% in April, which is a record high number. And our uh, electricity consumption has grown significantly, significantly as well. So we see that uh, this trend will go and hopefully uh, region as a whole world, Georgia, will recover from this uh, COVID situation. Uh, in Georgia, in, in general, Georgia being at the crossroads of the western and eastern parts of the world has an important advantages for saving the energy bridge. There are a number of successful transit projects on, uh, in Georgia and in the region. And as you already know, we already host Bakot Pilisi, Jehan, South Caspian Pipeline and Western Root Energy Pipeline projects intended for the delivery of Caspian Sea resources to the West. Georgia has been a reliable country for many, many years and has an intention to enforce the transit potential in the future. It is a significant part in the chain, ensuring uninterrupted and secure transit across the South Caucasus, contributing to the energy security of the European Union through the diversified sources and routes and Southern Gas Corridor. Given this context, of course, we are very happy to see the development of TANAP and TAP projects. Uh, since 2014, uh, when Georgia signed the association agreement with EU, and since 2017, when Georgia became a fully fledged member of energy community, Georgia is taking uh, efforts to develop better matched regulations in order to increase market access between European Union and Georgia. We appreciate the fundamental principles of European energy market architecture, which builds on the merits of the market opening and competition, security of supply, extensive develop deployments of renewable energy, energy efficiency promotion, and low carbon energy development. It should be emphasized that these directions, their priority importance, and EU reformative activities are appropriately valued and regarded as the best practices here in Georgia. In this regards, government of Georgia made significant efforts on working on the primary legislation, which embraces all necessary characteristics, including the third energy package, uh, including the third energy package. In particular, uh, Georgia has adopted the new energy and water supply law, law of Georgia on promoting the production and use of energy from renewable resources, energy efficiency law, and so on. On our way to the energy reform, we had defined the long-term structure and certain measures for establishing an organized electricity and gas markets. More precisely, our goal is to move from a vertically integrated structure towards a structure with legal, financial, and functional separation of transmission distribution functions from suppliers, traders, and generators. This move allows for foster competition at the wholesale level, which will cascade into the retail markets. The competition, and competitive market will promote efficient utilization of the cross-border trading capacity with our neighbors and open the sector for competitive forces, including from the foreign participants and investors. Uh, currently in Georgia, within the country, ongoing hydro, wind, and solar projects are around 3,925 megawatt of installed capacity. And forecasted investment uh, in uh, coming years is around 5 uh, billion US dollars. When we are speaking about developments of wind and solar energy projects, it should be taken into account that one of the main challenge which uh, we are facing nowadays is the grid limitation. According to this study, which were conducted recently by international consultants, national grid has limitation in lies with integration, variable renewable energy, in particular, uh, we have uh, set three phase uh, 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 grid, uh, renewable energy grid integration program, and by which by uh, 2030, Georgia could integrate 1,330 uh, 1, megawatts of wind energy and 520 megawatts of uh, solar power into our grid, which is a significant number, considering that Georgia currently uh, has peak demand of electricity uh, around 2,300 megawatts. So more than 20, 25% uh, of uh, our uh, future generation mix uh, will be uh, wind and solar energy. Uh, even though we are rich with uh, hydropower resources, uh, our uh, current uh, generation 
a mix is uh, around 80% hydro and 20% thermal energy. Uh, we cannot avoid uh, talking about the challenges we, we have in energy sector. Uh, development of hydropower sector becoming more and more problematic. We have a strong opposition from um, green uh, NGOs, environmentalists, local population, civil society, which calls up for uh, stronger communication, stronger negotiation and openness of the whole process. A uh, few words about energy security with a view of strength technique of Georgia's energy security. Government of Georgia continued to take active steps towards upgrading and enhancing the energy system, including designing, rehabilitation, construction, and exploratory works. To enforce interconnectivity with neighbors, we are actively working on domestic and cross-border transmission infrastructure besides developing generation facilities. The appropriate 10-year network development plan, which um, presents the time tag program designed to reinforcing infrastructure on the national transmission system, addressing the existing problems, responding to the future challenges and implementing the opportunities is updated on annual basis. At the same time, we work to develop cross-border electricity trade and create north, south, and east-west electricity corridors. Potentially, the letter gives Georgia and, of course, the rest of Caucasus states opportunities to trade with European countries as Turkey's electricity trading capacities are connected with EU neighboring countries. We have very strong ties with Turkey and with Azerbaijan, Russia, and Armenia, and we are uh, actively transmitting um, not only oil and gas, but as well electricity from Azerbaijan to Turkey, from Russia to Armenia, and expecting locally generation electricity, exporting locally generation uh, electricity to Russia and Turkey. Uh, this is uh, it uh, very briefly. Thank you very much for the, your intention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Cavani. And I, we are seeing questions rolling in now, so we wanted sure. to get some time for, for Q's and A's. Um, we can shift now a little bit more to, to the companies that are involved in, in this process. We've, been, we've heard about BP and different things, so it's a great chance now to uh, hear from Bob Scher, who is the head of the International Office of BP US in Washington, DC. Bob? Uh, hello. Um, I, I will unmute myself and unmute it. Uh, so um, thank you for the chance to, to speak. Um, thank you for putting me late in the uh, panel so that all the interesting things that I could possibly say <clears throat> have already been said by everybody else. So, um, but I will just sort of give a little bit of a, of a discussion about BP in the region and what we see for the region. Um, I was reminded in the opening montage uh, from yesterday that uh, this is not the first time that uh, I and many of us have been on these uh, video uh, seminars. And I'm sure at that point I was talking about the Southern Gas Corridor. I'm also sure that at this point, everybody is excited to not hear about the Southern Gas Corridor anymore. That's not to take anything away from the accomplishment. The 11 buyers, the seven countries, the 3,500 kilometers and the 16 BCM of gas to markets. I feel like I have to mention that. That is a huge part of the region, of what we've done and of the importance of the region when it comes to energy. But What's important now, and I think the great part about this conference is that we're looking to shift and to see what else it is that we can look at this region. And in terms of in still the importance, as people have said, of gas, of some of our traditional hydrocarbons is still going to be important for a little while. We in BP talk about this as performing while we're transforming. We know that we have to continue to operate, that the world needs access to energy. I think that, uh, I think that Kurt Donnelly talked about that as well while simultaneously we have to be switching to a cleaner approach to providing energy, knowing that our planet requires that. And I think this region and our work in Azerbaijan specifically is a really excellent indication of this and an example. But as I did go back and think about um, what I had said in terms of the completion of the Southern Gas Corridor, um, I, people may remember, I, I went back and looked at my notes and thought, what was it that made this important, uh, sorry, not important, but what is it that made this able to take on this incredible challenge? And I listed five things, um, an important and a very good business case, great public and private cooperation, high-end technical experience and expertise, great partners, and a clear goal and a mission. 
And I think what's interesting is when I went to look back and figure out what I wanted to say here in terms of the transition in the energy sector, those things are all critical and all are a part of this. And I think it's important, as Kurt again said, the private sector has a role. And I think the private sector does have a role in cooperation with the public sector to figure out how we get to a cleaner environment while still ensuring that we provide energy to the people who need it. But all of these things are important. We have to have a business case. And certainly renewables, we clearly have a business case. And we've seen this all around the world. We clearly need to have public-private cooperation. And again, let's use Azerbaijan as an example. Deputy Minister Sultano talked about this. We in BP have, have an MOU. <clears throat> First of all, we have an MOU from February that um, we talked about how we are going to cooperate on a range of issues in terms of ensuring that we have decarbonization projects, mobility systems, and renewable projects. And that that is something that we did with public-private partnership. And again, on June 3rd, the 240 megawatts of a solar project in Southwest Azerbaijan. We have technical experience, and that's one of the things that we in BP feel strongly that we bring to this. We have a, a long history in renewables and others and figuring out these complicated projects. We have great partners, um, and, and SOCAR is, is chief among those. There's a broader consortium from Shadanese, but obviously the BP and SOCAR relationship is far beyond just those. And without that cooperation, without those partners, we couldn't go further. But I want to spend just a very little bit of time on the clear goal and mission. And that's, I think, what really drives a lot of this here. So BP, in BP, we have as our driving ambition to be a net zero company by 2050 or sooner and to help the world get there. So I think it's important to note that it's not just about what we are going to be doing, but what we can hopefully help others and the world get to because it's, it's, all, it's all one planet. Azerbaijan has a stated goal to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 35% by 2030. These missions, these goals drive us just like the clear goal and mission of providing gas and connecting from the Caspian region into Europe drove the Southern Gas Corridor. I would argue these missions, these ambitions drive how we think about the future of energy in the region and elsewhere. And this, even in an area, a region, and with a company that traditionally both have looked as being overly reliant on fossil fuels. And I think that's another really important piece of this is that you can do both and you're, we're going to have to as a world do both. If you want to reduce emissions, if you want to provide new ways of energy, why not look to the people who understand and, and are producing a lot of those emissions and understand the energy environment to begin with. And I think that's where we are very excited about this partnership in the region, but also as we look forward to figure out how we can look at this and, and transform and reimagine energy, as we would say, on our own. So I really think that, that this is a great framework, not just for uh, BP and Azerbaijan and SOCAR, but a good framework for the region. Look, as I said, we know we have to perform while we transform. We understand that in order to fund the transition within BP, we still need some of the fossil fuels that we have. But in line with the IEA, as Kurt Donnelly talked about, we're not looking at new places to explore, new geographies. We understand that we have to work with where we are and then work to transition to alternative fuels and look to figure out how we can be on the front end. And what's great for BP is that we have great partners in the region that we are committed to that same clear goal, that same mission, and that we can work with our partners just like we did during the Southern Gas Corridor and the development of Shock Denise and how we can move forward in this very important area. I will stop there since I said, as I said, most important things have been said already and look forward to seeing if there are any questions uh, I can help answer. Thanks, Bob. You're underselling yourself. You said quite a few important things. Uh, maybe you weren't supposed to, but that was really helpful. Thank you so much. Um, if I can now turn to another old friend, uh, Mr. Fouad Qureshi, who is Equinor's VP and country manager for Azerbaijan and, and uh, Kazakhstan. Mr. Qureshi. Yeah, thank you very much, Bob. And thank you very much to the Caspian Policy Center for uh, 
uh, inviting Equinor to speak today. And this is my first time in in this in this gathering, so uh, uh, let's uh, let's see how it goes. But um, you know, um, we'll. Uh, you know, Equinor as a company, of course, is is committed to uh, not only the energy transition, but playing a, a leading role in that transition. Um, you know, however, we don't underestimate or diminish the importance of oil and gas and the and the importance that uh, hydrocarbons will will play in the energy mix for for quite a while yet. So let me start by by just taking a look back at some things that uh, are familiar to everybody, but I think that maybe Equinor's role in them. You know, we haven't talked about them, or at least I haven't in this setting, at least. So Equinor is represented in the Caspian region largely through its activities and other. Bajan, and it's one of our largest and longest standing international commitments. We've been operating in this country since 1992 and one of the biggest foreign investors here. And uh, our uh, journey in Azerbaijan started with, of course, with the, the signing of the PSA for development of the Azri Chirach uh, and Deepwater Ganeshli field. Uh, ACG, um, and this, the agreement was signed in 1994. Of course, we know it as the contract of the century, so century due to its significance for the socioeconomic development of the country and energy security of the region. In 2017, the ACG PSA was amended and extended for 25 years until the end of 2049, and an additional production, production platform is being built right now under this uh, extended PSA. Daily production at the ACG field is currently around... Uh, uh, on average, about 485,000 barrels. Um, Equinor is proud to be a partner in the ACG consortium together with the operator BP and uh, seven other partner companies. And we hold a 7.27% uh, interest in the extended ACG PSA, uh, which throughout the years has drawn new investment and technology to the country and has contributed to the transformation and diversification of energy supplies to Europe. Another valuable asset, which is of course affiliated uh, to this in our portfolio is the uh, 1,800 kilometer long Baku Tbilisi Jehan oil pipeline, which is the main export route for ACG oil. And from the Sangachal terminal on, uh, on the Caspian shore, it transports oil through Georgia to the Jehan terminal on the Turkish Mediterranean coast. The pipeline has been operating since June 2006. And from that time until the end of 2020, it transported around 3.7 billion barrels of crude oil. It's operated by BP in Azerbaijan and Georgia and by Botash International Limited in the Turkish section. And uh, our share, Equinor share in that is about 8.7. It is 8.71 percent. And uh, through this project, uh, we've participated in uh, social investment uh, initiatives through both ACG and BTC projects, and we've contributed to the sustainable development of local communities and larger society in the areas of education and small and medium enterprise development, uh, building skills and capabilities in communities, agriculture and environment. Turning now a little to what uh, Vitali uh, was mentioning. We're constantly looking for new opportunities in the country and in the region. And in May 2018, Equinor and SOCAR signed a risk service agreement for the appraisal and development of the uh, Karabagh uh, offshore oil field and a production sharing agreement for the um, Aipara Dan Ulduzu Ashrafi um, PSA area in the Caspian Sea. And in these two projects, Equinor and SOCAR hold equal shares at 50-50. In March 2020, Equinor and SOCAR uh, confirmed an oil discovery in the Karabakh field with clear commercial potential. To operate the license, Equinor and SOCAR have established, uh, again, a 50-50 um, joint operating company. It's called the Karabakh Joint Operating Company, and this is already established and functioning in Baku. And uh, we're currently working with our partner, SOCAR, to mature the Karabakh um, field development towards uh, an eventual investment decision. The exploration area that I was mentioning, um, it, uh, it's, it's an adjoining area, uh, adjoining the Karabakh field. It's between the field and, uh, and, to, the, and to the north uh, and, and west of it, um, between the field and the shoreline. Um, and it's located around 100 kilometers northeast of Baku. In 2019, Equinor conducted a seismic survey uh, over this uh, PSA area. And we were um, embarking on drilling an exploration well on the IPARA prospect, uh, but it had to be um, postponed due to the onset of the pandemic and overall economic challenges. Uh, but we hope very much to resume exploration operations uh, in, in coming years. And, and I have to uh, mention that the, uh, the discovery on Karabakh uh, that I was talking about earlier on in March last year, that was the first uh, certainly sort of offshore uh, commercial discovery um, since uh, the year 2000. So, you know, um, so we're doing some 
some some sort of new things if 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 in sort of an older uh, and established uh, area of activity. Um, on Adua, uh, we have seismic data that we've been evaluating through 2020, and there are very encouraging indications. So Equinor views Azerbaijan and the Caspian region as important for our business, where we have established excellent working relationships and acquired valuable experience of operations. We will also work uh, together with local partners to tackle cost, market, and logistic logistical challenges. And we are also engaged with local partners on low carbon initiatives with reduction of greenhouse gas emissions from operations, uh, offshore wind and low carbon hydrogen being the topics of greatest interest. The, the greenhouse gas emissions project, uh, we've uh, basically, we've uh, worked together with operator BP to identify uh, reduction potential uh, in ACG based on our uh, experience of the same on the Norwegian continental shelf. So Equinor has been in this Caspian basin for almost 30 years. Uh, with partners, we are positioning ourselves for the next 30 and beyond to ensure a central place for this important energy basin, basin in our future portfolio. So thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much. And actually, if I can pick up on one thing that uh, you mentioned, Fouad, about pulling experience from the, that Equinor has gotten from the Norwegian continental shelf. I think that's something that we sometimes forget about, that the companies are able to pull experiences that they've picked up in different markets. And what you've learned in the Caspian has been applied. Uh, I know in, well, I know the, what companies have learned in the Caspian has been applied in, in the Gulf of Mexico, for example. So this is another thing we need to look at. Um, our final speaker is Mr. Eldor Tulyakov, um, who is the executive director of, of the Development and Strategy Center in Uzbekistan. Mr. Tulyakov, please. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me. <clears throat> Dear friends, uh, participants of the forum, your excellencies, I would first of all like to express my gratitude to the Caspian Policy Center for organizing such, uh, such a, a great forum. And thank you all for sharing your valuable thoughts on the topic. Uh, I want to start by mentioning some facts uh, about Uzbekistan. Uh, prune energy reserves of Uzbekistan are more than 3 billion tons of coal, coal 1.1 trillion cubic meters of natural gas, 590 million barrels of oil. Annually, Uzbekistan produces around uh, 60 billion cubic meters of natural gas. In 2019, uh, production totaled uh, over 60 billion cubic meters, uh, whereas decreasing to almost 50 billion cubic meters in 2020 due to the pandemic. And the uh, current energy mix of Uzbekistan is as uh, following. The total in, uh, installed uh, generation capacity approximates 12,900 megawatts and is uh, dominated by uh, thermal power uh, plants uh, over almost 85% um, and uh, over 14% uh, hydropower plants. TPPs also produce almost 90% of electricity in the country and the total generated electricity mainly comes from uh, natural gas. Uzbekistan is considered one of the wealthiest countries in terms of renewable energy sources and uh, it has the potential to produce uh, over 50 billion tons of oil equivalent based on uh, solar energy. With uh, current technology, it would be possible to generate uh, 175 million tons of oil equivalent, more than triple the amount of uh, fossil fuel the country produces annually. Moreover, um, the situated hydropower, as uh, the, uh, excuse me, the uh, studied uh, hydropower potential of Uzbekistan is estimated at 27.5 billion kilowatts per hour. And currently the country uses only 39% of the technical hydropower potential. Along with other uh, spheres, Uzbekistan has been reforming its energy sector according to the 2017 strategy of actions on uh, five priority uh, development areas. And it, it sets uh, priorities such as redu reducing energy consumption and resource intensity of the economy, the wide, uh, widespread introduction of energy saving and green technology stimulating increased use of renewable energy, increasing productivity in the economy. And um, to uh, achieve these uh, above mentioned uh, goals, uh, there are different documents adopted like the program of measures on the further development of renewable energy and energy efficiency, strategy for the transition of Uzbekistan to the green economy for the period 2019-2030, uh, concept uh, of the electricity supply in Uzbekistan, 
for 2020, 2030. And moreover, uh, we should mention that in 2019, the Minister of Energy was established to reform this country's energy sector. Uh, and uh, very importantly, to have a single policymaker because in the past, there were many players in the market. In addition, a uh, state program for 2021, uh, followed by President's uh, annual address to the parliament, highlighted further reforms in the energy sector. Uh, in particular, several uh, state-owned companies in the electric power, oil, gas, and chemical industries are being transformed based on the um, consulting uh, companies, uh, services like Boston Consulting Group, World Bank, EBRD, ADB Baker, uh, McKinsey, uh, Rothschild, and many others. And uh, these efforts show will to abolish the monopoly uh, in the energy sector and introduce the private sector in the market. Uh, the implementation of a uh, project in the field of green energy in Uzbekistan will allow the next 10 years to increase the share of electricity production using renewable energy sources more than three times up to 25%. It's planned to build about 10 gigawatts of new ener uh, renewable energy facilities to achieve uh, these targets, including uh, five, uh, five gigawatts of solar, three gigawatts of wind, and 1.9 gig gigawatts of uh, hydroelectric power plants. Uh, for these uh, for these uh, purposes, foreign investments are being attracted, and cooperation with uh, foreign countries is expanding. Uh, uh, to, to give an example, the World Bank and Mazdar. Uh, ADB and the government of Uzbekistan signed a loan and guarantee agreement on December 2020 to finance the first 100 megawatt solar power plant in the country. And the uh, plant is uh, expected to start feeding power uh, directly to the national electric network already in 2021. Uh, it will produce 270 gigawatt hours per year of electricity from solar energy sources. And uh, thanks to the project Uzbekistan, which generates 85% of its electricity in uh, thermal power plants, will be able to reduce its dependency on natural gas and uh, coal. Another example is that uh, recently on May 20, Uzbekistan announced the tender results for uh, constructing two um, uh, photovoltaic power plants with the capacity of uh, 180, 20, uh, 220 megawatts. Uh, in the Samarkand and, uh, and uh, Jizakh regions, uh, again by, by Mastar. And uh, since 2017, Uzbekistan um, has also become interested in improving regional cooperation and has engaged in initiating multi format dialogues and setting barriers, uh, settling barriers of uh, cooperation with neighbors, which creates a stimulating environment for enhancing regional energy cooperation in Uzbekistan. And I should mention that reopening of Central Asia United Power System, CAPS, promises to promote regional cooperation uh, because currently the Central Asia United Power System links Southern Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and the Kyrgyz Republic. Uh, in, Uzbekistan has endorsed the transit of Turkmen electricity to the Kyrgyz Republic and Southern Kazakhstan with the possibility also open for winter deliveries to Tajikistan. And we think that uh, in the end, I should mention that these efforts, I, I, I believe uh, it will also start involving uh, Afghanistan in uh, regional cooperation. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Those were all very helpful remarks and also I think good in helping us remember um, you know, the, the need to be sort of ex expanding not just in terms of energy flowing west, but also in terms of energy flowing east and south and to the, both particularly in the rest of, of, of Central Asia. We only have a few minutes for questions and there are a number of very good ones that have come in. Um, I do wanna ask one question of my own before I, I get to the Q's and A's that came in. Um, and that is a number of you have talked about, and I agree very much as the need for private sector financing and how that comes into the picture. Uh, having sat um, in Mr. Donnelly's seat, um, and others, the, uh, there's always a lot of demands for, for capital. There's only so much capital out there. How do we attract it to helping make the, uh, make the transformation take place? It's not just governments got to do this, it's private sector. And if I can maybe just ask, um, um, maybe one of the company reps to talk and one of the government people to talk, maybe that would be good. Um, 
given the given the limitations of my Zoom screen, if Bob or uh, Fouad want to jump in or Vitaly, go first, and then somebody from the government side. Sure, I, I'm I'm happy to uh, take a quick. I mean, I think. Um, we all know that the answer has got to be some kind of cooperation between uh, private and public. The incentive structure that needs to be there um, from the, the public sector, I think, is something that does create the opportunity for more investment uh, from private sector companies. Um, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, but, you know, we're BP, uh, Equinor, we're not charities, right? We believe in doing the right thing. We know that we need to operate in a way that puts less carbon into the atmosphere because we have a limited carbon budget for the world. On the other hand, we have to provide value for stakeholders and shareholders. So it has got to be a combination. You know, We also, by the way, know that we're not gonna make money into the future as just an oil and gas company. That's why we have to have this switch. But I do think it's important to have the right incentive structure that means that the capital, that we'll have return on capital investment um, because otherwise we will go to other places to have return on capital um, where the public sector and the regulatory structure is better. And we'll still do these you know, renewables, we'll stu still do clean energy, but we'll have to go places where the regulatory environment and the tax environment it gets us a better return on investment. That's why this public-private cooperation is so important. And also I think the other financing outside of just the private sector financing will be important. Thanks. If I could ask either uh, Deputy Minister Sultanov or Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary Donnelly to take a crack at that. Bob, I'll, I'll try quickly. Um, first off, have to agree with Bob that if, if we want private sector money to be there, private sector moves to places where there's profit. So investors, big companies, um, that's, that's key. Um, I think there is a lot of money to be made in, uh, in this transition. That's why companies like BP are getting ahead of the game and preparing themselves to take advantage of that. So it, it, is, it is an enormous challenge, but it's one I think that, that there, there are ways to accomplish. It's gonna require huge amounts of money. Um, on the government side, we'll do what we can development finance course uh, corp corporation is very much focused on on the renewable energy transition XM and some of our other um, development finance uh, agencies are doing the same the ifes are looking at this but but that's a small small part of the solution the big the big part of the solution the bulk of the solution is the private sector and um, it it then falls to individual countries to, as Bob said, create the incentives, a stable investment uh, framework in their country, uh, incentives, other things that make it um, much more uh, attractive to the flow of international finance and international companies to help us solve these problems. So it may be that there's gonna be a lot of, co a lot of competition for, for that money uh, at certain periods in this transition. Um, but it is absolutely necessary, very, very important. And we're trying to do our part on, on uh, helping achieve those goals. Thanks, Lodes, Kurt. Um, if I could turn now, a number of questions have come in for Mr. Salvatore. Um, and this has to do basically with the import of electricity um, from the Caucasus to Turkey and maybe beyond. Um, if you could talk, Dr. Salvatore, a little bit about how you sort of see the potential for Turkey importing not just natural gas from, from the Caucasus, but also energy, but also electricity from the region. Any particular problems or potentials there? Well, thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Well, as you may know that we have been importing um, significant amount of gas from this Caspian region, as you know, but in order to increase uh, diversification, and to secure our supply, as uh, just I tried to explain, we invested a lot to increase the entry and exit points of Turkey by just establishing FSRUs and increasing our the, the, the capacity of our LNG terminals. And uh, by this way, we are expecting to, to increase the competition in our market and to, to provide the, to, the, to include the, the, the diversified, diversified gas 
uh, importation to our market uh, to increase the competition. As regards to electricity, um, we initiated the liberalization process in 2001. And maybe 15 years ago, we have been in, in we, we imported, let me say, uh, for example, electricity from Turkmenistan via Iran. But now, um, the, the as regards the total installed capacity, um, we don't need too much in, in electricity to import, but we have a um, free electricity market. And if any investor wants to invest, import electricity from our neighboring countries, electricity, um, a regulatory authority can just allow them according to the technical criteria. Um, we are the member of as Turkey to the European network for the transmission system operators and so we and we have been just uh, the several uh, supply companies um, importing and exporting electricity via between Turkey and Greece in on a monthly basis and on the eastern side we have connection with all, all our neighbors including Georgia Iran Iraq and and, and uh, it's, it's free for the, the newcomers, for private sector who are willing to just import or export electricity from our neighboring countries. We have been just reinforced our just um, electricity interconnections. Thank you very much. I know we're at, um, really coming at the absolute end of our time, but there's one particular question I'd like to ask for uh, uh, Mr. Chikavani. Um, we've talked a lot about the environmental aspects of hydrocarbons. But one thing that has come up recently has been the environmental impact of, of cryptocurrency mining. And I know that there have been a number of reports over the years regarding this going on in Georgia. I don't know if you can talk about this, Mr. Chikavani, but do you have any particular sense of where that stands um, in terms of uh, Georgia? Do you think this is something that's going to be re-examined? Yes, the, that's a very uh, important question and uh, which is, has been discussed uh, today. Uh, when we uh, make uh, electricity forecast and um, uh, when we make energy plans for the future, uh, it's almost impossible uh, to see what will happen to, for, for the crypto mining. At one point, when uh, we had a regulated market, uh, it almost reached 10% uh, of our total energy demand. Uh, but since we opened the market and uh, uh, crypto miners were uh, forced to trade on the competitive electricity market without any electricity subsidies, many of them have left country, moved uh, to uh, different countries, but still, it still remains an issue and challenge. And, uh, and there are different ways to, uh, how we can solve this challenge, how we can uh, make the change this um, uh, situation. Uh, there are no uh, ready recipe uh, and we are of course uh, watching uh, our neighboring regions, also developed countries, how they dealt with it. But I can say that the uh, uh, competitive market has really helped us to uh, stop this fast growing uh, demand, which uh, actually made challenges for our energy security. Thank you very, very much. We appreciate that. I think we are now at the end of our time. And I know um, for those of you in Central Asia and the Caucasus, it's getting late. Um, but very much appreciate your participation and your comments, uh, your insights. And I think also showing how the energy picture is changing. Um, this is not the conversation we would have had even a couple of years ago. If I can turn the floor over now to Afghan. Thank you, Bob. Uh, thank you for excellent moderation today. and. Uh, once again, I would, I'd like to thank all our speakers. Um, Piotr Anoli, Acting Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary, um, Deputy Minister Soltanov, uh, Deputy Minister Shalabekova, Director General, General Dr. Selvitov, uh, Vitaly Beylebev of Sokar, uh, Mr. Jikovani, uh, Bob Sheff from BP, um, Econo Representative uh, Dr. Guraishi, and also Mr. Tulyakov. Uh, uh, for being part of this panel. And I think everyone enjoyed uh, the discussion. Uh, we are now taking 30 minute break, virtual coffee break. Hopefully next year we can host you all in person and have a actual in-person coffee breaks. Uh, I look forward to having our audience continue following the TCF 2021. This is our fifth uh, Trans-Caspian Forum. Uh, we will have our last session in starting at 11 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, once again, thanks again for joining us. I very much look forward to continuing our discussion over our final session. 
thanks a lot and uh, see you next year.